Hey, what's up, everybody? Listen, if you have not heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. Number one, it's free. Yeah, I got your attention now, right? Number two, there's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Number three, Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. Number four, you can make money from your podcast. That's right. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum viewership. Number five, it's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. So right now, Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. What's up, everybody? My name is Cliff and you are listening to the What Now Podcast. That's right. The What Now Podcast, where we, through conversation, discuss ways that we can effectively address life's most difficult moments. So sit back, relax, and enjoy tonight's episode. What's up, everybody? Welcome to Transformation Radio 2.0. That's right, Transformation Radio 2.0. It is Sunday night. We are on on a, a special night, on a special night. Usually, we're on on Monday nights, but those who have been following the show, you understand that the month of December is very important to me because it's my birthday. So as my uh, celebrating my birthday, I wanted to share the stories the stories of diverse individuals throughout the entire month. So we're kicking it off on tonight, all right? Listen, I want to thank you for tuning in on tonight. As I said, you're listening to Transformation Radio 2.0, where we embrace the uncomfortable conversations that are connected to our purpose, all right? Now, listen, I'm going to open up the phone lines throughout the show. Y'all know what my rule is as it relates to the phone lines. I open them up. However, each caller is limited to one minute. And the reason why we limit the callers to one minute is because we want to be respectful of our guests. We want to give them enough time to share their story, as well as give other callers enough time to call in. So, yes, I will hang up on you. Don't take it personal. Just understand that I want to make sure that we're giving our guests enough time, all right? Another thing about those who call in, you guys know how important it is to me that we are all respectful of each other and each other's opinions. No, we are not going to agree on everything. You're not going to agree on everything that I say. You're not going to agree on everything that my guests say. However, we have to learn how to disagree respectfully. And when we learn to disagree respectfully, we listen from a place where we can grow and then we can create a world that's better for us and the generations that are to come, all right? So the call-in number is 516-387-1756. Again, 516-387-1756. Now, guys, I always say this, so you're probably like, you always say you're excited about the show. I'm really excited about the show tonight. This young man has an amazing story that I believe that we all need to hear And I believe that if we'll listen to his story, then we can even grow, you know, within ourselves, you know. And one of the things that I encourage everybody to do is to embrace your story. Embrace your story. Sometimes we get so caught up in, I want to discover my purpose. I want to discover my purpose. Yet we're running from some of those things that we label as embarrassing, you know, that are connected to our stories. But many times, It's those things that we feel are embarrassing or those things that, you know, kind of put us at what we felt was a disadvantage that actually opened us up to purpose. So that's my encouragement to you. 
embrace your story. Understand that there are people that need to hear your story, and more importantly, you need to share your story. So now, without further ado, I want everybody to help me welcome to the show, Mr. Darius Lavelle. Hello, everyone. Darius, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me on the show. Definitely, definitely. We're we're excited about this conversation. Now, here's how we're going to start the conversation, okay? We're going to play a little game of word association. I have eight words. I'm going to say those words. I want you either to say the first word that comes to mind when you hear that word or what that word has meant to you in your personal life. Okay. Okay? All right. All right. Life. Life, a gift, mm. abandonment, an ongoing issue that I have presently. <laughs> I, just, I get it. Love, yeah. why, what actually. What actually represents me, I am love. Oh, I like that. Okay. Let's go back real quick because I was trying to get through the game, but I like what you said about life. Now, have you always had that mindset as it related to life, that life was a gift, or is that something that, you know, you that grew and developed as you were growing and developing yourself? To be honest with you, I didn't start seeing life as a gift until now, um, within this past year, to be honest. Um, life before a year ago was a curse to me, something that I didn't want to be a part of, something that I didn't want to live, something that um, I was angry about. Why would the higher power put me somewhere surrounded by mean people? horrible people in a world where there's so much hate and um, somewhere where I never fit. But I didn't understand or didn't get the gift part about life until now. And, um, and I think that's only because I'm starting to step into my season of, of greatness um, and I'm starting to own it. So I'm walking, not only do I have faith, but I'm walking by faith now. And when I started to do that, I started to see the gift of life, and I started to be appreciative and grateful for it. Awesome, awesome. That makes a lot of sense. I like that. Okay, now transformation. Hmm, transformation would have to, for me, I guess that would be my life's journey, um, life's journey, transformation. Yeah. Yeah, I think as you were talking and you were sharing about, you know, how this year you finally, you know, begin to embrace it as a gift, it was funny to me because the next word was transformation because it was like, oh, yeah, it's almost as if it was a transformation for him to see life as a gift within this year. Okay. Yes, definitely. Mental health. <laughs> oh no, I'm sorry. What'd you say? No, no. Go ahead. You're you're good. <laughs> okay. Mental health. Mental health. <sighs> A current issue that I currently deal with. Okay. Okay. All right. Tenacity. Hmm. Something that. I'm still working on, but getting better at. Okay, okay. Now, acting. My passion. Yes, okay. All right, so now that we played the game, we got the game out of the way, now I want to ask you to tell us a little bit about yourself. We can start from your childhood. How was your childhood? Hmm. So, my childhood, I would describe as being 
very introverted, um, full of imagination. Um, my mother had me at the age of 14. Um, mm-hmm. I was born in Augsburg, Germany, um, and raised wow. in Vincenza, Italy, in Nuremberg, Germany, only because my mom having me at 14, my grandfather um, was stationed in the military, and he was actually stationed in Augsburg. Um, and um, my mother um, was my so my mother was raped, or my father, my biological father, um, forced this up on my mom. Okay. Um, okay. And I was brought into this world. Um, my grandparents kind of wanted her to get an abortion, of course, because she was young, mm-hmm. um, and they didn't think that motherhood was something she was ready for. Plus, with under the circumstances of how I was conceived, um, they just thought that would have been a better decision for her and for me. Um, so I grew up with my mother and my uncles and aunts. Something similar almost as if they were my brothers and sisters. Um, my uncle that is closest to me is five years older than me. Then there's an uncle seven years older, and then there's my mom, and then there's my two aunts, um, then my grandparents. So I was the only child that was in my age group. Um, so I didn't have other kids to play with. Um, so I, I played by myself. Um, and I was very imaginative, and, and, and even now, I'm a person of imagination. I have a great imagination. I'm very youthful, and I think that is because I grew up always using my imagination, um, being very creative. I used to read um, a lot, draw a lot, um, write poetry. I stayed to myself. Um, And within all of that, there was a sense of loneliness. and then at the age of, for my mom, at the age of 18, she met my um, my stepdad, and they married. And this was more so the first time that I was being introduced to a father figure. Mind you, I did grow up with my grandfather being, you know, a grandfather. But there's a little difference when looking at, in my opinion, looking at my grandfather a grandfather title and a dad. Um, and my stepdad, um, I'm not going to say he was a bad man. He's not a bad man. Um, but I do feel he treated me differently, especially when my brother and my sister came along. Um, I started okay. noticing there was a, there was a difference um, in treatment. Um, he tre- I, I felt as if I was treated as a stepchild. Um, whether or not my mother saw that or not, um, it affected me in a way that I started comparing myself. And I think that's when comparing myself to others and other, uh, other, other people's lives started for me. So I started comparing myself to my brother and my sister. Um, and that's where the inadequate feelings of emptiness, loneliness, and, um, abandonment started for me. Um, and as we got older and we stayed overseas, now living overseas is a total different experience from living here in the United States. They're a little bit more liberal there. They're a little bit more free. They're a little bit more open. Um, you can be who you are without so much judgment. Um, so at the age of 12, my mother and my stepfather divorced. And for me, that was like a sign of relief. Um, because I don't, I, I didn't feel as if he was the best thing for me. Um, mm-hmm. And when they divorced, we moved here, back here to the state, to Georgia, to where my grandmother, my mom's mom, and my grandfather lived. And I ended up going, because my grandmother lived in an all-black, like, area. So I ended up going to an all-black middle school and an all-black high school. And it was a culture shock. So coming from overseas where most of my friends were white or they were other light-skinned,
and mixed children like myself. Um, coming here and being surrounded by other African Americans, um, seeing the behavior, it was a culture shock because I had never been around a group of people that were so loud and so um, judgmental and angry. And, 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 and I'm, I'm, I'm going to be, I'm going to be honest with you. I, um, I think a lot of us are conditioned at a young age to start focusing on negative things um, more so than positive things. So all I could mm-hmm. see was all the negative behavior and, that's when the bullying started. That's when the mistreatment started. I started being called white boy because of the way that I talked, the way that I dressed. My mom always kept me dressed very preppy, slacks, penny loafers, dress shirts. Um, of course, the other kids didn't dress like that. Um, the boys started calling me mud, you mixed breed, um, because I was lighter skin and I had curly red hair and um it went from that to faggot to sissy um and these were were terms that i wasn't really familiar with only because at that age i wasn't sexual i never i don't even think i had ever encountered anybody that was gay or that was considered a faggot or a sissy so all i knew that i was being called these things and it was a negative, it was negative, and it wasn't a good thing. And so I started growing up not only feeling like being lighter skin wasn't a good thing, but also apparently the way that I talked wasn't a good thing, the way that I dressed wasn't a good thing, the way that I walked wasn't a good thing. Um, And I completely shut down. And I was already an introverted child. So all that did was isolate me more. And on top of that, unknowing by my parents, um, we didn't know that I was bipolar. Um, So my bipolar started at a younger age. And to be honest with you, it's hard to diagnose mental health issues like bipolar um, schizophrenia, other mental things, um, um, issues with children because it's harder for a child to articulate that they're depressed and this is why I'm depressed. So a lot of times most people don't get diagnosed with those things until they reach, you know, teenage years, like their late teens. So until I was 19, um, I was a very depressed child. Um, On top of that, I had got um, sexualized too early. So for me, I started watching porn at the age of three and it would be, and it was because I think my grandfather, um, my grandfather watched porn. And I think one day I got up by myself like three o'clock in the morning or something and I pushed play on the VCR because that's when VHS was popping. Um, and yeah. <laughs> I, I, and me again being the only kid in the household, um, I started watching this stuff on TV and I was very curious about it. And I had a little pattern of waking up at night by myself, pushing play on the VCR and watching porn. And um, I would start, I, I remember, I, th- I would take baths with my mom, and I all of a sudden started having questions and being curious, like, what goes into there, and what is this? And my mother stopped bath time with me. She, she cut out bath time, and she actually told me about the birds and the bees at the age of three because she had no choice because I started asking questions. Um, so while going through all of these things, like the bullying in school, um, on the inside, when I was by myself, my imagination swirled around sex. And um, I was always curious about sex. And um, I, I, But that was something that I kind of kept to myself. But dealing with the depression, dealing with the um, 
feeling like I didn't fit in, no one loved me, no one liked me. Because for some reason in the South, there's this mentality, this slave mentality that still exists to this day where back in the, you know, slave days where the lighter skinned slaves were in the house and the darker skinned slaves were in the field. And there was mm-hmm. this separation between the two, and there was a little animosity there. And the darker-skinned right. slaves, of course, felt that like the lighter-skinned slaves were, you know, thought they were better. And that mentality has carried on from generation to generation to generation. And the reason that I would say that it is more prevalent in the South is because when I've lived up north or when I've gone to the West Coast, I don't get treated like, by being light skin is not a not a um, you don't stick out like in New York you have Dominicans you have Puerto Ricans you have other mixed people it's a melting pot so but here in the South there are people that don't like me for one because I'm light skin won't date me because I'm light skin already feel like I'm stuck up I'm conceited I'm a slut I'm a whore I can't be faithful there's all of these prejudgments put on me because of my my skin color, and none of those things are true. So as a kid, to come from overseas where I was accepted for being who I was, whether it was because I, I, I dressed the way I dressed, I looked the way I looked, I was never teased and bullied about that. But to come here to the States and all the black kids, all the black boys, even the black girls, attacked me because of that reason. So the bullying got so bad from from fifth grade to sixth grade to seventh grade to the point where, you know, I tried to escape it by trying to hurt myself and by trying to want to kill myself. Um, and it was, what, sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade, I tried, you know, to attempt attempted. And I remember the last time in school that I did try it had to be my junior year of high school because the bullying was so bad. The boys were pulling down my pants in front of everybody in class. They were slapping my head. Every day, it was almost like I was so fearful to go to school. I didn't want to go to school. I hated school. Um, And the only way that I could get away from that was to lock myself in a room, and I would cry almost every day. Um, And to be honest with you, I don't even know how I even graduated high school. Um, there were times I just wanted to drop out and just run away, but my mother kept a very, very tight leash on me when it came to school. Um, and I, and, and to be honest with you, my mom didn't even find out that all of these things had happened to me until, um, I got older and I did my first bout of drug rehab. And, um, so there was never anyone that I could turn to or talk to as a kid about what was going home because there was no there was no escape at home because I wanted to escape from home because of my you know because of my stepdad and um and the feelings that I had associated with with my brother and sister the comparison that I was an outsider or that's just how I felt um and then to have to, you know, most kids get away from home issues by going to school, but there was no escape going to school for me because I was getting bullied. So the depression became so bad and the suicide thoughts were so bad to the point where I just did not enjoy life. I hated life. I thought that I was a mistake. And I think that also around this time is when I started having questions about my biological father and where was he at? You know, and I remember being 12 years old and um, not understanding why my father had never reached out to me or tried to look for me like, my brother and sister's dad is there, where's mine? And um, I think I tried to kill myself or hurt myself because of that reason. And my mom reached out to my father. She found him and she reached out. And I remember having a conversation with him one time at the age of 12. Um and that was it. And then we went into my high school years and <clears throat> in high school I wasn't sexually active, but I knew on the inside that I had an attraction to the same sex. Um but because I was always being teased about it in school, it was something that I 
never wanted to even act upon. Plus, dealing with the depression and dealing with thinking that I was crazy and that something was wrong with me. I just thought that the thoughts that I had about other guys was really, I was, it was wrong. I was crazy because we're taught at a very young age that homosexuality is wrong, especially in the black culture. It's wrong. It's not accepted. Um, you need to fix that. You need to change that. You just need to, 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 you know, get with some girls and be around some females. And um, because I was introverted, it was something that I just wasn't interested in. Um, and I didn't lose my virginity to a female until I was, like, 18. With a guy, I was 19. But I chose to mess around with a girl first because I needed to know for myself and I needed to do it, quote, unquote, the right way first. Before I just did it with a guy. <laughs> Before I just did it with a guy. And I remember my first girlfriend. Um, I was 18, and we dated um, in high school, in my senior year of high school. And, um, I chose a white girl. And mm-hmm. I chose a white girl because white women, in my opinion, are very more accepting when it comes to things such as masculinity, femininity, a white woman doesn't care if her man is a little Nelly, feminine. Um, but for black women, they want a thug. They want a hard, masculine man. Most black girls don't even want to date a light-skinned guy, especially if he's a pretty boy, because there's this competition. I don't want a man that's going to be in the mirror more than me, because these are all of these, 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 these labels and these judgments that are placed upon a light-skinned person, period. And it was easier for me to be myself around my ex-girlfriend with no judgment. And um, and to be honest with you, we used to have a lot of sex. Um, I think that when my mom and my family found out that I was having sex, because my family knew I was gay before I knew I was gay. Um, so it, no. so for me to come home and like, oh, I have, a, I have a girlfriend and, you know, I've lost my virginity. I think it was like, they were really shocked for one. And I remember my <laughs> grandparents even letting me have sex in the house with her because it was just like, I guess it was such a great thing. Like, oh, he has a girlfriend. Yeah. Um, and even though we, her and I had a lot of sex, it was, the problem was, it wasn't her that turned me on. It wasn't her that got me off. I would have to think of all of those porn knows that I was secretly watching. <laughs> all of those dirty magazines that I was looking at um, that was getting me off and not her instead. So um, uh, fast forward. I go off to college. Um, I'm on my own for the first time. I graduated at 17. So I go off to school, and I'm away from home, finally away from the bullying. And I remember being accepted to – I got accepted to the Art Institute of San Francisco because I was a drawer. I used to draw. Um, And I got accepted to Georgia State and a couple of other colleges, but I am, and a lot of people were, why didn't you go to one of the black schools in Atlanta, Morehouse, um, Morris Brown, Clark. And at that time, after going through all of the bullying by the black kids, I refused to continue my education in another black field school where they could do that to me all over again. So I chose Georgia state mm-hmm. because it was more diverse. Um, and to be honest with you, that's where my um, animosity toward my own people came from. I did not like black people. I did not want to be around black people. I thought black people were ratchet, ignorant, mean, and angry for no fucking reason. And, um, you know, I would feel like any time that I ever had to be around, like, like if I had to go to the projects, or if I had to go to a, a, a black area where it was predominantly more black people, I always felt uncomfortable. My stomach would start to turn. I would get nervous because in my head, somebody is going to pick on me, do something to me, attack me. 
And so I avoided black areas, black people altogether until I started dating men because I was more drawn to black men. And I think that also comes from the fact that my biological father was never there. Um, And I started to try to fill in this void with men. Um, And that itself became a whole nother issue of problems because now not only am I dealing with the the bipolar, not only am I dealing with, you know, the 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 depression, um, in the same sex issues that I'm having within you know, conflict within myself because I'm I'm I wanna do something that is labeled wrong, but how can it be wrong when I didn't choose it? You know, it, it had always been in me. So Again, it started reiterating that feeling of something's wrong with me. I'm not supposed to be here. I'm a mistake. So I got turned on because now I'm in college, and, of course, college kids like to experiment with drugs. I get turned on to ecstasy. I get turned on to cocaine. And in my mind, I think I have found the cure for my depression. Because now I'm high, but not only do I not feel depressed, not only do I not feel sad, I get this bout of confidence. I get this bout of security. Like, I I feel un- invincible high on drugs. Um, and so at this time, again, I hadn't been diagnosed with bipolar. So the drugs became a sense of medication. I started self-medicating. And anyone knows that if you have a condition that's an ongoing condition, um, you take medicine every day, right? So I had to get high every day to maintain that state of emotional wellness. In in my mind, that emotional wellness, that state of security um, and confidence. And the thing with drugs is drugs – if you do have a chemical imbalance, drugs offset it even worse. So when you come off the drugs, your chemical balance is lower than where it was, especially if it's already low. Um, Mm -hmm. And then your body, not only does your body become dependent on it, you emotionally, mentally become dependent on the substance. And from there, within this lifestyle of same sex, there is this sense of everyone's looking for validation because, again, we're all taught at a young age homosexuality is wrong. And a lot of us don't have family support. A lot of us are abandoned by our families. I am... I, I, I'm I fortunate. I'm very fortunate. My family accepted me, has always accepted me for who I was. So my first sexual experience with a man at the age of 19, after I did that, I came home and told my mom about it. And I go, Mom, you know what? I'm gay. <laughs> and, you know, I was never treated any different. But, again, I'm, I'm – Fortunate, and I know that a lot of other gay men and gay women out there don't have, didn't have that same, that same um, luxury um, of their family supporting them. So we're this is a community of hurt people who, for one, think that it's wrong to be who they are, for two, have no support, and for three, are lonely and looking for validation. So you have a bunch of hurt people hurting people. You have a bunch of hurt people turning to drugs to deal with the validation and the emptiness and dealing with and turning to sex. So we're using all of these things to validate ourselves. We're using all of these things to to have some kind of connection to another person Um, because we're all looking for love, but we're going about it in the wrong way. And I got swept up in, 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 in that lifestyle. And I ended up dropping out of school. 
and I ended up turning to adult entertainment. And that, in my mind, so with acting, I've always had the acting bug. I dance, I draw, I sing a little bit, I can rap a little bit. I'm very multi-talented. Mm-hmm. Um, I write poetry. Um, I do a lot of things. Um, but when I was approached with the opportunity to do porn, mind you, I was a very insecure guy, very insecure, thought that I was very unattractive. Again, I didn't think it was a good thing to be light-skinned. Um, again, I'm in the South, in Atlanta, so, you know, all there were always these judgments based upon me, so I thought that if I did porn, that everybody would love me, and that it would, like, like the drugs, it would be the cure the cure. It would bring attention to me. Um, I was looking for that validation. So with me already having a natural talent for acting, porn was easy. Once I saw that I was good at it, those insecurities fell because I was able to create a character that was sexy, that people wanted to sleep with, that people wanted to know. And I created Kid, and Kid was everything that Darius wasn't. Kid was confident. Kid was attractive. Kid was talented. And then there became this sense of not only do I not have to have free sex with someone, meaning when we are giving ourselves to another person sexually, nine out of ten times, the only thing on the table are our emotions, or our feelings. We're vulnerable. And mm-hmm. the experience that I was having from the vulnerability of giving myself to someone that I was attracted to and that I really, really liked and that I saw myself dating and possibly you know, could see myself marrying and having kids. See, I saw all of that for myself at one point. But the only thing I kept getting were guys sleeping with me and then dogging me out and leaving me alone, not returning my phone calls. Or if they did return my phone calls, it was because they wanted to have sex with me again. And I got tired of getting my heart broke. Mind you, I'm dealing with depression. Mind you, I'm already dealing with validation issues and abandonment issues. So because of all of these things, um, when I figured out that I could have sex and I could get paid for it, I would choose to have sex with the ugliest, unattractive, fattest, oldest person and get my bills paid instead of having Mm -hmm. free sex with this attractive man and getting my heart broke. Mm. pros and cons pros and cons let's outweigh it and I chose escorting and porn for 2000 Alex and (laughs) (laughs) and it was a way that I protected my heart it was a way that it, it, it actually gave me power and within that industry you have a lot of predators a lot of these companies that a lot of these people running these companies are, you know, taking advantage of these young models and it's a, it's, a, it's a business. It's all about money. But when you're dealing with giving your body, giving your, your spirit, your soul to another person that you don't know, you know, you're so tying. There's a lot of, there's a lot of things going on mm-hmm. there, you know, that we don't even realize. All we know is that, you know, we're being thrown some money and, you know, of course, you don't own any of those royalties. You sign away all of those rights to those movies. Those companies own all of that money. And, wow. you know, for for 18-year-old, for a 19-year-old, for a 22-year-old, 21-year-old, $300 is a lot of money, <laughs> you know. Right, right. And you know, of course you're going to take that and they're going to sell it. They're going to pitch it to you 
in a way that it just sounds like everything. Oh, you're going to be a star. Let me tell you something. The only thing that you, you get out of, out of pornography and being an adult entertainer, especially if you're black, is popularity, is a following. What, how many millionaire porn stars do you see? How many billionaire porn stars do you see? True. It's almost like you become a Beyonce in popularity, but you're broke as hell. And so the only way to kind of make up for for that income is escorting because now that you've built a following for yourself, now that you've got so many people desiring you, they're willing to pay any dollar amount now to have you. And so now you become enslaved in a world doing things that you typically normally wouldn't do with people you typically normally wouldn't do it with. For a dollar. Now, can I ask you a question right and, here? Yes, okay, sir. Okay, I'm going to ask a question. Man. I'm, I'm enjoying this. That's why I'm not saying much. I just want him to get his story out. Um, my question is, as, as you were talking about the industry and everything and talking about how you sell, sell away your rights, is that why now we see such a rise in, like, the only fans? And is that the – Yep. Um, the the stars just taking back their power basically because you know now they you know you set up an OnlyFans and boom. Well, you know, well for 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 one, for one, the adult entertainment industry took a big hit just like the music industry did when people started downloading music for free, artists. And record labels lost a lot of money. And now the only way for artists to make up their money is now they have to tour. Now you have to do appearances. Um, it's the same thing with porn. When people start started stop buying DVDs, because nobody buys DVDs no more, because now you can you can watch the shit for free, you know, on on the internet. Um and even with OnlyFans, a lot of people are not even are stopping buying the OnlyFans subscriptions because if you go on Pornhub and, and these other porn sites, you can watch They're the being, same uh, people that you're doing these subscriptions because people are leaking their videos. Mm-hmm. Um, so when the porn industry started when losing money, Oh, that's when the, the the actors started losing money as well because now they're not going to pay as much as they were paying back in the day. Um, unless you just king ding-a-ling and you got a real huge dick and you're a cash cow to this company. And guess what? Now they're going to juice you and they're going to milk you and you and you know, make as much money as they can until the next big ding-a-ling comes along. Um, right. But so now the models now are having to do more appearances at clubs and things and escort to make up for the money they're really not making in porn. And these companies, and I'm going to say the black companies because the white boys, the white boys are making money. This is a white okay. man's world. And they treat us just like slaves within this industry as well. Um, they're not going to pay you as much because guess what? We're not going to ask for that much. And we're not, we, it, it's like, you know, I was always taught not not all money is good money. Just because somebody's dangling money in your face, you know, you have to still have some kind of moral and value and, and, and stand for something. But when you come for nothing and you don't even know what, what, what money is and, and what a good life is, of course you're going to take that little dollar amount and you're going to let these people Absolutely. exploit you. You know, th- these companies, and I'm not going to name any names, but there are companies that weren't telling some of these, these guys that some of the other models were HIV positive. And a lot of guys got infected. A lot of guys caught other STIs and things. And, you know, a lot of these young boys were used and hurt. And I've met so many guys along the way, you know, as I was coming up in the industry that were being exploited and that were being used. And I, I couldn't really say anything about it and I couldn't really do anything about it. But I felt it because I, when mm-hmm. I started realizing what was done to me, because now I'm seeing it outside of me. Um, and that's when the, the fun stops 
for me. You know, when when I started realizing I was being used and I was a pawn, you know, um, and what was even hurtful, more hurtful was the way that my fellow peers treated me. The same people that watched me had everything under the sun to say about me. But you're just as guilty and, because and, um, you're watching it. Can, can we stop right there for a minute? Because that I think that really cracks me up. Like <laughs> that you can be judgmental about something that you secretly enjoy. Like I know there's a lot of people that are listening today because they know you as kid. They know you as the icon kid. But they'll never publicly admit that that's how they know you. They they'll never publicly admit that. And like you said, they will. A, a more or less attack and, and throw all type of shade at you because of that. Right. For doing something that everyone does, sex. <laughs> right. And the, the I think the, 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 the worst thing about it all is there are, I don't even do porn anymore. I haven't, the last porn I did was almost five years ago, four or five years ago, somewhere in there. I stopped counting the years. Um, but because um, I, I said I would not be one of those guys that, said, oh, I'm going to retire and then go back into it. Um, There are still guys that will not date me because I've done it. There are still guys that talk mad shit about me because I've done it in my past as if a person can't change. Yes, I made a poor decision for the wrong reasons when I was younger, and I'm still Mm -hmm. paying for that decision to this day because it is still new because it's ongoing. There's still playing it on the internet and there are people who are still watching me for the first time as if I'm still doing it. And so they're thinking that I'm a person that's still actively doing it. So, but I, I I can choose to focus on that negative stuff, but there are just as many people that hate me and there are just as many people that love me. And there are people there. I, 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 I still get hit up by, you know, young guys that, you know, either are asking me advice about, you know, they want to do porn, should they do it? Or I get guys that, that have hit me up, and I remember a couple of guys that hit me up and said that I made them feel comfortable about being slim because, you know, skinny guys always get talked about because we don't have the fattest asses and we don't have the, all the body and the muscles, which is one of the reasons why now I'm as big as I am because I was so insecure about being skinny. I got tired of reading people people telling me how I looked like I was a skeleton and I was a skinny bitch and I looked like I had AIDS and all kind of crazy shit. So what that forced me to do was get my ass in the gym and start working out because I got tired of being defined yeah, I mean, by something, by people. I mean, yeah, yeah I mean, that, I think that's, that's, Go ahead. that's the Go ahead, major transformation that we um, – you're good, you're good. But I just want to interject real quick. You know, that's the major transformation that we can see, you know, those that have been fans of you. Like, it's like, dang, yo. <laughs> like, like that's kid. Like, that's what, you know, I'm, that's you, what I thought when I first saw you again. I was like, whoa, the transformation that's taken place. That's what honestly made me listen to some of your videos. And then I was like, oh, snap, I need to get him on here so he can share his story. Go ahead. Yeah, and it was believe me, it has not been and I'll say anyone out there, to get to get bigger and to get to my little and look, I'm still considered small. And I hate when I hear that. I hate when people go, Well, you're still small as hell but you know, because I know all <laughs> how much hard work that I put into getting the size that I am. And in in and but within all of that, it's 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 the the the, the I don't, I just don't understand why. Can you identify any areas in your life where stagnation is manifesting? Now, I know some of you might say, no, I can't. Well, I want us to look at stagnation for what it really is. Some people have identified stagnation as something that's not growing or that's not producing. I don't believe that stagnation. To me, stagnation can also be that yes, we're growing, yes, we're producing. However, we're growing and producing in a manner that's disrespectful to the purpose and the greatness that resides inside of us. 
And listen, we all have areas where we can identify that we could be doing a lot better in. There's greater potential in those areas than we are experiencing. And guess what? I have a tool that will help you begin to experience transformation in those areas of stagnation in your life. And that tool is called From Stagnation to Transformation. That's right. That is my book, From Stagnation to Transformation. So I want you to head over to my website, www.cliftonpettyjohn.com. I want you to hit there. I want you to hit the Transformation tab. There you're going to find a free preview of my book. That's right. A free preview of my book. And I promise you, after you read the preview, you're going to want to invest in your personal transformation through purchasing the book. So again, hit over there. Purchase the book. Let me know you purchased it. Here's what I always say, guys. If you purchase the book, you read the book, you apply the principles in your life, and yet you still are stagnant in the areas that you are applying them to, and you're not experiencing any transformation, and you can prove to me that you have applied these principles, I will give you a a 100% refund. That's right, a 100% refund. Why? Because I believe in the application of the principles that are outlined in this book. So again, visit www cliftonpettyjohn.com and purchase your copy of From Stagnation to Transformation. We as people can't celebrate each other for our accomplishments. Why do we always have to look at negative things and tear another person down? Because you do not know the circumstances of a person's decisions and why they chose to do what they're doing. Just like with drugs, we are so quick to sit here and judge a person because they are they have an addiction. Do you realize that that, that I don't think none of us wake up in the morning and say, you know what? Today I'm going to turn into a crystal meth head. You know, today I'm going to just choose to just throw my whole life away and just get high. It, 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 it's more intricate than that. It's more intricate than that. It's in, 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 in if people can't have empathy and realize that we all have some addiction to something, whether it's shopping, whether it's sex, whether it's, oh, you know, I know, I know people who, who work out too much. Shit, they're addicted. I know people that be in the gym all day long, every damn day. That's not right. healthy. You know, too much of anything is not healthy. But instead sure. of, you know, I, and I always feel like this, if you care so much about the next person and their drug addiction that you got to go around and talk about them, why don't you go and help them get off a of drug? Why don't you go and you take them and, 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 and educate them? And you know why they don't do that? Because they know nothing about it themselves. So if you know nothing about it yourself, why are you even speaking on it? And I also because I'm gonna tell you, that many times people will... I can talk about what your addiction is because that makes me not have to face what mine is. So I'm going to deflect and tear you down. And while I'm tearing you down, now I don't have to face the reality that I'm already torn down. Right. Or it makes me feel better about myself. It makes me deflect Mm -hmm. in, 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 you know, everything that's going on with me. And I just put it on the next person and, make them the bad guy because I'm ashamed of what I'm going through or what I'm doing. But let me tell you how karma works. Let me tell you how the universe works. There's a guy that I used to be so madly, madly attracted to. I liked him so much. And at this point in time, I was on crystal meth and I was using, and um, anytime he saw me and I was high, he would go the fuck off on me, and he would be really hard on me. I hate when you're on it. You 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 look crazy. You act crazy. But in the same sense, he would still have sex with me. He would still have sex with me. He would still fuck me. This guy made me cry at least, I can count, three times. He just made me just feel so bad about myself and about my addiction. And now that same person, now he's a crystal meth head now. And when wow. I found out that he was doing the drug, I got so angry. And I got angry because I remember him making me feel like shit for doing the very same thing that he's doing now. But see, that's how the universe works. 
He would take you and knock you right off of that damn high horse that you're on yeah. and put you in the same position that you were sitting there judging the next person on. And now, Absolutely. and he's still on the drug, you know, and I, w- I-, I lost all respect for him because he made me feel so low for something that he's now facing and he's now having to deal with himself. Now, and it's the same. That situation, oh, sorry, go ahead. The situation you just brought up, has that made you have a greater compassion, um, greater empathy for those who are addicted to whatever they're addicted to? Oh, yes, most definitely. Because I know how difficult it is. I know how hard it is to keep getting back up after you have thought that you were done and you were never going to turn back to it. And all of a sudden you end up right back at that same place. And you're like, how the fuck did I get back here again? And then everybody judging you for it and everybody making you feel bad for it. Like if you just, all you got to do is just stop. Well, if it was that yeah. easy to just stop, there would be no drug addicts in the world. Correct. And obesity wouldn't be in the world. You know, poor eating exactly. habits wouldn't be in the world. You know, that's the reality of it. But I think that sometimes what happens is many times we want people to be sensitive to our situation, but we're not putting sensitivity out in another person's situation. And like you said, you, you create that energy, you're going to reap it. You create it, oh, you're going to oh, reap it. So. And so let me give you an example of my karma because, see, I speak from I statements. I, I don't like speaking in, on something that I don't know anything about. And, see, that's where, uh-huh. what makes me and sets me apart from other people because if I know nothing about it, I'm not going to even speak on it. I'm going to shut my ass up, and I'm going to be quiet, and I'm going to learn, and I'm going to listen. Right. But okay. for me, over the years, I put my mom through hell. I put my mom through hell with the drug usage, my mom not knowing what's going on, my mom worried about me, my mom not knowing if I'm going to kill myself or if somebody else is going to kill me, Um, disappearing, not answering my phone, like all of these things. And, 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 And letting her watch me kill myself slowly. And to her, I'm going to be honest, that wasn't fair. That was not fair of me to do that to my mom. And the only reason that now I'm starting to see the glass on the other side is because a very close friend of mine is killing himself right now with drugs, and he's had two heart attacks already, and he is still choosing to relax and get high, and I'm having to watch it and <laughs> Now I know how my mom felt. And that's my karma. That's my karma. And we as people have to do better. If you truly care about human life, if you truly care about your friends and your family and, and this world, we need to do better at helping, contributing, being empathetic. We are such destruct, destructive, judgmental creatures that it's sick to me. It's so sick to me sometimes when I have to go on social media and I see the stuff, how we promote fighting. We, we promote fighting. We'll, we'll, we'll sit there and, and, and like a picture of somebody with a massive heart on, or we'll like something because somebody's fine as hell, but let somebody have some clothes on and they're trying to promote their their, their album or let somebody be sitting there and, and, and trying to. Hmm? Hold that thought real quick. We're ready to go off the air. I want you to hold it. We'll talk about it off the air, air okay? Thank you for joining okay. us on tonight. All right, so we're off the air. I'm going to let you keep going. Um well, what I'm gonna I'm gonna let you finish that thought. Then I'm gonna ask you those three questions. And what I want to know is, are you willing to come back for a part two? Because I want to talk about the acting and 
the transformation that you experienced and what it is that you're doing now? Because I know you just graduated with your associates, right? You right. Just earned, uh, earned your associates. Graduate. Well, uh, so I, would I, you I, be I finished. With, I finish that next week. <laughs> Okay, okay, so I got you. Okay. <laughs> okay. So would you be willing to come back on to do a part two? Most definitely, because that hour went by really fast. <laughs> I told you it was. And and I didn't say much because I just wanted to give you an opportunity to get your story out because I'm finding a lot of people are so judgmental of people and they're missing opportunities that could really bless their life. Like you were talking about how people still judge you off the fact that you were a porn star and you haven't even done that in five years, and they're not even realizing the gift that you could honestly be in their life. So that's why I wanted to give you the opportunity to come on. That's why I didn't interrupt you. Uh, I've interrupted you as little as possible because I just wanted you to get your story out so that people could hear. I'm so now what I want you to definitely do is, want to do a part two. Okay, cool. We can do that. We can do that. What I'll do is when we get off, I'll, um, I'll email you with a date that we have available and see what works for you. Okay, most definitely. Okay. So I want you to go ahead and finish how you were saying we got to do better. <clears throat> so... I feel like, and I've always said this, if everyone stops pointing the finger at the person in front of them and turn that hand around and point it at themselves, the world will be so much of a a better place. We cannot change the world from outside of ourselves. You start change from within. You lead by example. And it's those of us who have the hardest times and the most challenging times in life that the higher power wants to use as a testimony, Mm -hmm. as a vessel to change this world. And when you start realizing those individuals, when you start realizing who you are and that what you're going through, yeah, it, it is uncomfortable. Change is always uncomfortable, but it's for a greater purpose. And it's not that you is not supposed to hurt or it's not supposed to be uncomfortable. You just have to learn how to weather the storm. The storms are going to come. But it's how you weather them. It's what you do in the middle of the storm. It's about being still. It's about learning how to take what has happened and focus on the positive because there's a positive and a negative in everything. Again, Definitely. it's a choice to to look at the negative or to look at the positive, but again, we're conditioned to look at negative parts of things. So I just had my 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 heart stepped on a little bit um, this past week. I was interested in somebody, and like most dudes, he just stopped calling and stopped taking my text messages for no reason. And it was it's so easy to internalize that as. I did something wrong. Is something wrong with me? But that's not the case. That's a personal issue. He was the one that stopped answering calls. He was the one that stopped texting. Right. That was his problem, not mine. I did the best that I could do in getting to know that person. But the positive that came out of that situation was I dodged a bullet. Apparently, this is not a great communicator. Apparently, this is a person that's afraid of 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 getting to know someone. Apparently this is someone who knows nothing about courtesy and decency and can't be not only honest with me, but honest with himself for whatever it was that was the problem. And that is what I'll take with me and move forward in my life. And then I will apply it to the next person that I come across and then I try to get to know. It's all about and I hope, evolving. Right. right? And I hope that that other people are out there listening because you took it off of you. You could carry that as a great weight and try to figure out, well, what should I? I shouldn't have said this, or maybe I should have did this, or maybe I I didn't call enough, or maybe I called too much, or maybe I should have sent a text right. earlier. Or, you know, a lot of people out there struggling with that and trying to, you know, conform or to uh, become something different than who they are 
not even realizing how you just explained it, how you dodged that bullet, because it's the things that you value in a relationship or in getting to know someone, and you now refuse to lower those standards because you're saying, hey, this apparently that's not what it is that he's looking for. Right. So that's great. And, and I it'll hope be everybody easier. Heard and it and it and it be and it becomes easier to to spot those those character defects in other people where you don't even have right. to take yourself through a whole week of getting to know that person whereas you can see it right when you meet them and um yes. and I, I and I tell everybody don't don't do not for one minute think that I'm um you know I'm not I don't go through those things don't ever think that, you know, I just have it made. And they'll be like, oh, I bet you got a list of people you can just choose and go through. I go through rejection <laughs> just like everybody else. You know, the ones that I want nine out of ten times don't even want me, ain't even interested in me. You know, but Sometimes I have to learn to like stop. <laughs> yeah, oh. it, it, it'd be like that. But, you know, at the end of the day, I had to stop searching for it. And you know, I had to stop being the chaser and let it chase me and find me. And within that time, until that person comes along, I develop the best person. See, we have to be that what that we're looking for, and people don't understand that. I have to be whatever that it is that I'm looking for. I have to be that. And until somebody can come along and outdo how I treat myself, then they're not the one. See, I have to treat myself like a king, right? So if I have to treat myself like a king and I want somebody else to come in my life and treat me like a king, they're going to have to outdo me because I should be doing the best that I can do for myself. And a lot of people that come along don't even compare to how I treat myself or how I would treat myself. You know what I'm saying? So Mm -hmm. I say that to all of those out there that are lonely and, you know, stop settling. Stop selling for these people that don't that don't that don't that they don't add no substance to your life. If if you have to second guess and sit there and think twice about if a person really likes you or not, that's the sign and that right there. You shouldn't be having no no second thoughts or have the second guess if somebody's into you or not. Because if a person really is, they would make sure that you know that up front that you're important, that they care. You shouldn't have to sit there and wonder. And and I think that's what we do a lot. A lot of times we we miss those little signs and we make excuses for them. And, well, you know, um, well at least he tried. No, the trying is not in my vocabulary and shouldn't be in yours either. Well, there you have it, guys. That was great. That was great relationship advice and great advice about loving yourself. And I think that's one of the things we're going to talk about on the next show as well. I think we're going to go ahead and end it right now. Um, is there – oh, give people your contact information if they want to get up with – well, not your contact information, but give people your uh, social media handle. Yeah, because Listen, I would end up having to change my number. <laughs> exactly. No, exactly. Um, we're not doing this. We don't do that. <laughs> but give people your social media handles um, because – a lot of people that used to follow you may not know that uh, you're, you know, what your name is now or, you know, all of those things. So I give you the opportunity to give them that information. Okay. So you can reach me on Instagram at Darius Lavelle. So that's spelled D-A-R-I-U-S, like Darius, but it's pronounced Darius. But that's Darius underscore Lavelle, L-A-V-A-L-E. That's Instagram. You can also request me. I'm very open to um, friendships on Facebook. Um, and uh, you can also look me up on Facebook as Darius Lavelle. Um, and right now, those are like the only two platforms that I'm using right now, um, basically because I am learning how to keep as much privacy as possible and social media can be very distracting and become overwhelming and drain you. So I'm only operating off of two. Two is enough for me right now. So, <clears throat> so again, Instagram, Darius underscore Lavelle. Um, and on Facebook, it's Darius Lavelle. 
All right, guys, there you have it. Darius, thank you again for joining us on tonight. And like I said, when I get off, I'm going to get you the information because I want to get you back as soon as possible to do part two. Uh, Everybody that listened, thank you for listening to the show. I appreciate it. I can't express how much I appreciate it. I do want you to connect with me on social media, on all the platforms. You can find me under Clifton Petty John. Also, to stay up to date because, like I said, this month we have shows every week. I think it's only one week we don't have it, and the only reason why we don't have that is because I'm going to be in the Bahamas for my birthday. So I'm definitely ah, going to Happy that. early birthday, so, <laughs> sir. <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. So um, we're going to be doing that this month, and I want you guys to keep uh, – I want you guys to know when the shows are going to be on. So visit www.cliftonpattyjohn.com, all right? Again, thank you all for joining us. And as I always say, create a great day, walk with purpose, and by all means, execute your vision. Peace. Peace.